This audiobook shows a mental magic that guarantees success and higher performance, no matter what you do for a living. This book would be a lot longer if it were possible to convince someone of something with facts and well-thought-out reasons. But it's not often possible to do so with written statements or arguments, because to the delayed judgment, it always makes sense to say that the author was lying or watering down the proof, making it invalid. Consequently, I have carefully excluded all reasons and endorsements, and simply ask the open-minded reader to practice the law of awareness as revealed in this book. All the books that could be written on the subject won't be as effective as your own success. The magic that sets a man free is his imagination. He tends to take a position in reality that matches his vision by training himself to imagine the thing he wants and refusing physical stimuli, even if it means imagining the opposite. Because then what he sees is his experience, not the physical things that moved him before. First chapter, Law and How It Works. The world and everything in it are just objects of man's conditioned awareness. Everything in the world is made of and caused by consciousness. So, if we want to know how the world was made, we need to look to consciousness. You can achieve everything you want in life if you understand the law of awareness and how to use it. For those who understand this rule, you can create and keep an ideal world. It's not a figure of speech. Consciousness is the only truth. To help you understand this world better, think of it as a stream with two parts, the awareness and the subconscious. It is important to know how the conscious and subconscious mind are connected in order to use the law of awareness wisely. The conscious mind is selected and personal, while the subconscious mind is not selective and is not personal. The subconscious is where causes happen, and the awareness is where effects happen. The male and female parts of awareness are these two parts. The aware mind is a man, and the inner mind is a woman. The conscious mind comes up with thoughts, and then presses them into the subconscious mind. The inner mind takes in thoughts, and gives them shape and voice. According to this rule, everything that comes from awareness starts with an idea and is then pressed into the mind. And there is nothing made that is made without this process. The conscious mind shapes the subconscious mind and the subconscious mind then reflects what it has been taught. The subconscious mind doesn't come up with ideas. It just accepts as true what the conscious mind thinks is true and objectifies those ideas in a way that only the conscious mind knows. Because of this, man has control over creation because he can think and feel and he can choose which thought to entertain. You can take charge of your mind by managing your thoughts and feelings. Deep in the psyche, in the female part of creation or the womb of creation is where the process of creation is kept. Induction has no effect on the mind because it is beyond reason. It thinks of a feeling as a fact that already exists within itself and then shows that fact through speech. And thought is the start of the creative process. It goes through a feeling stage and ends with a decision to act. Feelings are a way for ideas to get into the subconscious mind. The inner mind can't hold a thought until it's felt. Once it's felt, it has to be voiced, whether it's good, bad, or neutral. Being able to communicate thoughts to the mind only through feelings is possible. Because of this, a person who can't control his feelings may easily program his mind with bad emotions. Controlling your feelings doesn't mean holding them back or stifling them. Instead, it means training yourself to think about and feel only the feelings that make you happy. To live a full and happy life, you need to be in charge of your feelings. Never feel bad about something that is wrong or think about it with sympathy in any way. Do not focus on the things that make you or other people flawed. When you do that, you're telling your mind about these limits. If something is done to you that you don't want to happen, it won't happen. This is the whole rule for living a full and happy life. 
all the rest is just opinion. Every feeling leaves a mark on the mind, and unless a stronger feeling of the opposite kind blocks it, it has to come out. The one that is stated is the stronger of two feelings. I am healthy is a stronger feeling than I will be healthy. To feel I will be is to admit I am not. I am is stronger than I am not. What you feel you are always impacts what you wish to be, so for the wish to come true, it must be felt as a state that is, rather than a state that is not. The process of manifestation starts with sensation, and is the base on which all manifestation is built. You should pay attention to your thoughts and feelings, because they are linked to what you see every day. Your body acts as an emotional filter and shows clear signs of how you're feeling right now. All diseases are caused by emotional problems, especially feelings that are pushed down. To deeply care about a wrong without speaking or showing that care is the start of sickness and disease in both the body and the world. Do not give in to feelings of sadness or failure because getting frustrated or losing focus on your goal will lead to illness. Only think deeply about the place you want to reach. The way to all wonders that seem impossible is to feel the truth of the state sought and then live and act on that belief. All changes in how we say things come from changes in how we feel. A change in how you feel is a change in your fate. The mind is where all production takes place. Then you need to learn how to control your thoughts and feelings, which means learning how to control your brain. Things that happen to you are not the result of luck or chance, and your good or bad luck is not written in stone by fate. The rules of your world are set by the images you have in your mind. The mind doesn't pick and choose. It's indifferent and doesn't care about people. The inner mind doesn't care if the way you feel is true or false. What you think is true is always taken to be true. Feeling is the inner mind's journey to the truth of what is said to be true. This part of the subconscious mind made it possible for people to do anything. The subconscious can and must make real anything that a person's mind can think of and believe to be true. The way your world looks is shaped by how you feel, and when you change how you feel, your world changes too. Whatever has been pressed into the subconscious mind will always come out. As soon as it gets an idea, it starts to figure out how to express itself. It takes the feeling you give it as a fact that already exists within itself and starts right away to make the outside world look exactly like that feeling. The inner mind never changes what a person believes. It sees everything more clearly, even if what they believe is not helpful. To make your subconscious mind think of the state you want, you have to imagine how you would feel if you had already achieved your goal. When you're outlining your goal, you should only think about the goal itself. You are not to think about the way it is said or the problems that come with it. When you think deeply about a state, it sticks in your mind. Because of this, if you think about problems, delays, or difficulties a lot, your inner mind will accept them as your wish and bring them into your physical world. The mind is where new things are made. It gets the idea on its own through people's feelings. It never changes the thought that is sent, but it always shapes it. Because of this, the mind pictures the idea, the image, and the feeling that is received. Making yourself feel like something is bleak or impossible is a way to teach your mind that you will fail. Even though the mind serves people reliably, this does not mean that they are like servants to masters, as people used to think. Prophets from long ago called it man's slave or helper. The subconscious mind is like a woman, and Saint Paul said, the woman should be subject to man in everything. The subconscious mind does serve man and truly gives his thoughts shape. But the mind doesn't like being forced to do something. It reacts more to suggestion than to order. As a result, it looks more like the beloved wife than the helper. Ephesians 5.31 says, 
the husband is head of the wife. This may not be true for a man and a woman in their physical connection, but it is true for the conscious and subconscious minds, or the male and female parts of consciousness. When Paul wrote, this is a great mystery, he was talking about the mystery of awareness. He who loves his wife loves himself, and the two will become one body. Consciousness is really one and not split, but for the sake of creation, it looks like it is split into two. The aware, objective, or male part is really the head, and the mental, emotional, or female part is in charge. The boss in this case is not a tyrant though, it's a lover. This means that when you imagine how you would feel if you already had your goal, your subconscious mind is driven to create an exact copy of that feeling. Your subconscious mind doesn't accept your wishes until you feel them to be real. This is because a thought is only accepted subconsciously through feeling, and it is only through this subconscious acceptance that it is ever voiced. It's easier to blame the way the world is for how you feel than to accept that the way the world is shows how you feel. On the other hand, the outside always reflects the inside. As within, so without. A person can't receive anything unless it comes from heaven. The kingdom of heaven is also inside you. Nothing comes from the outside, everything comes from the mind. There is nothing else you can see besides what is in your mind. Everything in your world is an objectification of your awareness. Subconscious thoughts and feelings can be seen in objective states. When you have a change of opinion, your face changes too. Your mind believes what you feel to be true, and since creation comes from mental feelings, you decide what creation is by how you feel. You are already what you want to be. The only reason you can't see it is because you don't believe it. If you look for something outside of yourself that you don't think you are, you will never find it. You will only find what you are. To put it simply, you only say and have what you are aware of, being or having. To him who has it is given. The way to get what you want is to ignore the proof of your senses and take on the feeling of having your wish come true. Your biggest accomplishment is being able to control your own thoughts and feelings. Until you have perfect self-control though, and can feel everything you want to feel no matter what, use sleep and prayer to help you get to where you want to be. These are the two ways to get into your mind. Consciousness always takes on a shape that fits what it knows about itself. Knowledge that goes beyond what the senses can give us starts to shape us into the image of our true selves. There is only one mind in the whole world. That mind is in everyone. It is not limited to anyone or the body. It is a knowing consciousness at the center of everything that lives in everything. When it is outside of its body, it takes on the limits set by the information it gets from its senses about itself. But once you break free from those senses, by developing the ability to directly observe and know, you are no longer bound to their form. Perfect actions and works come from a deep belief in the mind-based cause of everything. Before he can change the outside world, a man has to change the inside world. Everything that comes to him from the outside is caused by his mind. Shifting his awareness changes how he sees things, which changes the world he sees. Getting a clear picture of the process, which is a result of mental images, put him on the right track to reach his goal. He is able to do perfect work because he works with his own consciousness, which is the source of everything. For as much as his mental images drive him to act, that action will always be true to the image in his mind and give him its physical form. Certainly this book has a plan for teaching the mind's image power so that a scene or situation you imagine will come to you in three dimensions with sound and color and with as much life as the real world. Have you ever had dreams like that? Have you ever been so absorbed in a mental and spiritual world while you slept that you were sure it was real in the real world even though you knew it wasn't? 
You will quickly see that the only way for each of us to be saved is to train our image power to follow us if you have ever known how powerful mental images can be in changing our thoughts and feelings. In this way, you can free yourself from nature's urges and commands, from death, sickness and damage, and from being helpless and angry. The person whose inner power of vision is stronger than the outside world's endless distractions has taken charge of his life and is truly in charge of his fate. What causes everything? In his famous speech, To Be or Not To Be, Shakespeare's Hamlet asked himself, what is the main challenge of life? Most people are just there, they are never really there. They are like predictable algorithms that respond instead of acting. They are like living encyclopedias of sayings, taboos, reflexes and syndromes. The gods must be laughing at the funny sight of robots thinking they are free. Still, the real meaning of freedom becomes clear when the conscious mind rises above nature's pain-pleasure concept. Finally, action versus response. There is no lucky event or favorable situation that will make us become something more than we are. Instead, we must look within ourselves for greater awareness. Being and becoming are the rules of life that is changing. Life is moving toward unknown heights, and the aroused soul answers the call, looks for, grows, and expands. If you do less, you will fall into the reaction cage of the ego, which is full of pain, suffering, limits, decay, and death. A person who lives by reacting to the world around him is always being affected by changes in that world. He is affected, but never changes what is happening around him. He could live for many years in this way, lost in his senses and the ups and downs of his outer self. But one day, the pain is so much worse than the pleasure that he realizes his ego is a loser and only a result of outside events. Then he either falls into full-on animal drowsiness or turns away from his senses and tries to become more self-aware and in control of himself. After that, he is on his way to really living and becoming. Then he starts to see what he's really capable of, and that's when he realizes the miracle of his own awareness and the magic in his mind. Being in charge of material things is not what gives you control over life. What gives you control over life is understanding their true cause and nature. It's not in the wise man's nature to try to change the world or force events to go the way he wants them to. Instead, he tries to reach a higher level of awareness that will let him see the hidden reason of everything. So, he gets a big role in events because he fits in perfectly with them. It looks like he's actually shaping them. He can handle the hardest tasks and most dangerous situations with ease because he is in tune with the mind force that runs the world and knows how to do the work that needs to be done. Mind with Electromagnetic Imagine this mental force that runs the world in any way you like. You can call it anything you want. Knowing that it exists, how it works, and how you relate to it are the most important things. One comparison would be to a very large electric field. As a result, all aware forms of life would be tiny electromagnetic forces within the universe and getting jobs within it, each based on the type and grade of its field, so, where each field would end up within the main field would be a matter of constant law and could not be avoided at all, as shown by the fact that millions of people do the same thing over and over again and get the same results every time, almost like they are following a routine. It's possible that they are always sick, always down, barely bitter, always broke, or always without a job. When we think about our own lives, even a little, we can't help but be surprised by how we seem to be stuck in the same position year after year. This terrible repetition is what causes most anger and mental sickness. It's the cause of all failure, but it can be stopped. And the way that it can be avoided brings total freedom to the mind and spirit. 
because the tiny electromagnetic field already has the power to change the type and quality of its field, it can be moved around within the main field with all the strength and certainty of the main field until it gets to where its new level of awareness needs it to be. The tiny electric field does not move on its own. This is an important thing to keep in mind. The big field moves it, and all of the big field's power is used to move it. It is clearly pointless for it to try to move because it is held in place by a power that is infinitely stronger than itself. It is held where it is because of what it is. As soon as something changes inside it, it is moved to a new place in the field that fits its new potential by a power outside it. Mental world. It's true that what was said above is an example, but SW. In his amazing book Psychical Physics, Tromp has definitely shown that people give off electromagnetic fields and that the Earth itself gives off electromagnetic fields. His examples are so well documented that there is no way that scientists could disagree with them. We may be very close to having solid proof of those parts of human desire that can't be seen, which have traditionally been the domain of thinkers, seers and priests. Our best colleges now have departments that study the paranormal skills of the human mind. It's only a matter of time before we are presented with the ultimate unchangeable proof of what we intuitively know, the power of mind over matter. We don't live in a real world, we live in our minds. The mental is what the physical is, and it's only a poor extension of the mental. It's not true that everything we see, hear and feel is true. It's just that our senses are giving us an imperfect picture of a thought we have in our minds. The focus on sense experience has made people pay more attention to effects than to causes. This has led scientific research down a dead end, where everything gets bigger or smaller into infinity, and it has kept people from discovering the secrets of life. Our attention is drawn not to the planets and stars, the elements and winds, or even to the fact that life exists at all. Being aware is it. Being conscious means being able to say, I. Consciousness is a fact, the biggest wonder of all, and everything else in the world is just a side effect, the hidden I. Being aware means being aware. There aren't any other kinds. There is the same I in you as there is in your friend. Even though it seems different because it is connected to different sense experiences, that is only because it has let those experiences shape it. The truth is that awareness is never the result of experience. It is always the cause of experience. And no matter where we find it, it is mostly aware of existing, of being, I. There is only one basic mind in the whole world. It lives in everything and seems different depending on what it happens to be in, but it really doesn't change at all. Being smart, aware, full of energy, strong and artistic is what everything is made of. It is the beginning and end of everything. The first cause, it's you. The forces of nature are in everything in nature. Emerson wrote that everything is made up of one hidden thing. He saw through the veil and saw that behind the seemingly endless forms in nature, there is only one mind and one intelligence that controls all life and all desires. Without this simple spiritual understanding, you can't be at peace with yourself or be sure of what to do. People who live apart from their roots are cut off from the source of all power and are left alone and without resources in a dangerous and unfriendly world. If you give him a chance to understand how life really works and how he fits into it, he will quickly realize that the world always mirrors his thoughts. The mask also known as the outer mind, felt self, or ego, is the bad guy in the play that is happening in our lives. Now, man as a form of life has grown enough to understand that he is different and unique. He knows that the animal he sees in the mirror is himself when he looks at it. He cares about how this animal looks and how well it is doing. He also thinks about how it connects with the world and other people. The only thing he knows for sure about himself 
is that he is aware and stuck in a body. He calls his newfound experience and knowledge I, along with his choice of how to use them. This leads him to mistakenly call a ghost by his own name. Behind this ghost, hidden by its battles and fantasies, is the secret self. This self moves everything on the chessboard of life based on its natures and goals, even when it is ignored or misread. We are never our past or present selves. These are just masks we put on when we play the roles we find in life. We are not something that changes. We are whole and complete, strong and calm, endless and forever. It comes from the source of all life, and when we learn to connect with it, our lives are changed in the most amazing ways. These changes are caused by a power that is so much bigger than our small, temporary selves. Robert Louis Stevenson said, The imprisoned self, to be what we are, and to become what we are capable of becoming, is the only end of life. But when we stop, when we don't follow our divine nature, when we don't break free from mental and spiritual chains, we are stuck and in pain. For as long as we only react to things that come into our awareness from the outside world, we can only be slaves in every situation. We are locked to our feelings and are thrown off by every input. We are angry, scared, happy, sad, seeking death and seeking life. But our inner peace and balance are always held by something we don't understand or can't change. This makes us feel like dolls, dangling by strings we can't see or touch, tossed around by life's chouse, like pieces of paper in the wind. In addition, if we learn enough to realize how useless we are, we are often filled with such deep sadness that breaking free from our bonds seems almost impossible. But the first step toward freedom comes when we stop long enough in the middle of life's chaos to realize that we are not moving because of our own choices or in response to them. Instead, we are moving because of what is going on around us. A person can only want to be free if they know they are slave. In the same way, you can only truly be free after having been in chains. The things we hate, love, fear, envy, want and lie about are usually caused by our situations, by false and limited rules and traditions, or by our natural fears of big problems that aren't that big of a deal. And the only way to solve all of them is to stand straight in front of them, dare them to do their best, and show them for what they are. This means giving up your loyalty to the cupidity of the deluding and blinding ego, which keeps us thinking we are better than others and less than we really are. This is the liberating power. You don't have to become a sage, a philosopher, or even a psychiatrist to understand the spiritual side of life and create a mental chain of events that will allow you to control your life. But you shouldn't instantly shut down anything that has to do with spirit just because it's religious. You may be a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Taoist, or a Shintoist, but that doesn't change the fact that you need to think about all the things that affect the world, your own life and death. It won't be clear that everything is in a constant state of growth, development and aspiration, and that there are no limits, finalities or defeats, and that anything is possible for the person who first imagines the image in his mind until you come to terms with your own mental essence and realize the transient, ever-changing nature of I. There is a power of total freedom within us that came from the mind or intelligence that made the world, and it can make us become anything and do anything. You can imagine that the stuff that makes up our minds is of a certain type and quality, that when we make mental pictures, they react by making a counterpart that we can feel. This means that any idea we have in our thoughts will come true in the real world. The pictures we hold in our thoughts become the things we experience in life. We can't stop this from happening. It doesn't matter how much we want or wish to change the way we live as long as we think a certain way. Only the dream we have inside us. Because of this law of life, it is shocking and sad to see the many thousands of people 
whose minds keep giving them the affects they say they don't want. They complain about being poor, but that doesn't make them less poor. They keep being sick, even though they keep complaining about how bad their pain is. They say no one likes them, which means they don't care about other people. They are not brave, not angry, and not creative in their thinking. They shake and quiver, and they can't get away from poor beliefs. The picture in your mind is given with the same amount of loyalty and speed, whether it is one of poverty, illness, fear, or failure. It is presented with the same level of promptness and faithfulness, whether it is one of wealth, health, courage, or success. All things, both good and evil, are made from an image held in mind. This is the law of life. A person walking a tightrope quickly moves out from his thin, stretchy support, which is held in the air by a thin black line. He appears to be in violation of every law. Even though he is very good at this, what really amazes me is that he is even brave enough to try. Still, he can't help but do what he's doing because of mental law. He made a picture in his mind a long time before he took his first shaky steps on a rope. Even when he was making mistakes at first, the picture kept showing up. He imagined himself quick, steady, and skillfully crossing the moving wire. This image kept him going through all of his early mistakes. At this point, he shows off his skill and bravery in the face of death, making people gasp. He is sure, calm, and sure of himself. The picture inside him keeps him from being afraid or having bad things happen. This is called image strength. The mind's image power is imagination, but no one seems to know what it is or where it comes from. A well-known surgeon is said to have said that after cutting open many brains, he had never seen a picture or thought. It's not true that the imagination is only found in the brain. The imagination is shared by the arm, the leg, and the stomach. It's not a part of the body or even the whole body that thinks. It's the person who lives inside it. Mind is able to understand its surroundings and itself thanks to that function. The only person who can say I is one who thinks, and the only person who can say I can see pictures inside himself that no one else can see. The most obvious thing about life, the endless struggle between knowing something and being able to know it, is always settled by two main parts of the struggle the person who knows something, and the thing that needs to be known. By definition, these seem to be two different things, and we can see that a man usually deals with the outside world by making a list of how it affects his senses. Something has a name because it is a certain length, width, weight, hardness, and color. And as long as most of those qualities stay the same each time it is seen, a person knows what it is, and can identify it. If you ask him if it's close, he can tell you right away by quickly looking around. If it makes him feel a certain way, like fear, anger, love, or tension, then the object's presence or lack can be said to literally affect his life. In that case, his state of mind is not something he chooses, but something that happens to him when he meets or avoids the item in the outside world. In a vision, or life in the forms of animals and plants, is simply a response. First, there is the body, and then there are the things that come into contact with it. This creates conflict, but it gets solved through evolution, as each organism tries to get past the problems it faces. In the early stages of evolution, however, this impact seems to come only from outside the creature and is caused by processes and forces that it can't control. The world and life are tightly held together by nature. Lower animal and plant life is pushed along a road it doesn't understand or can't escape. Something is the kind of thing it is because of a creative process that looks like it's not part of it. Existence itself, in any form, seems to be outside of the power and reach of a single being. We are born and die, and there is nothing we know or can do to help or stop these things. Also, because we live through our senses, the things that happen to us naturally shape the way our lives will go. 
Our imagination is the key that can free us from our chains. We have the power to choose what we think. We can choose to think from a deep inside source instead of reacting to things going on around us. We can decide that the images in our thoughts will no longer depend on the circumstances we find ourselves in. Instead, our visualization will come from our inner resources and power, in line with our goals and wishes. So, our real motives will shape the quality of our awareness, and we are immediately freed from the trap of giving every obstacle credibility, which is what gets in the way of our goals. Only things that take root in the mind can become facts in the world. This is the law that can't be changed. So, a person whose mind is only affected by the goals and plans he has made for himself is free from all loss and failure. Because problems only last a short time and don't change who he is inside. The secret self is like a mold where anything that fits his inner vision is accepted, finally at home, and allowed to grow in the secret self. The key to using your imagination correctly is to know about and believe in your secret self. When people know where the light is, they never live in the dark again. To understand the secret self is to break free from your circumstances and become lost in a power that has formed itself to make life work perfectly and be peacefully. This part of us that isn't the ego, isn't experience, isn't time, circumstance, place, or position. It's just awareness. The I stripped of everything but a pure feeling of existence. This is the evolving self of the world, which holds all power and is bigger than any one person or 10,000 people put together. It is the structure on which everything else is built. It's not just in the body or in one time, place, or situation. It's everywhere and at all times. Even though it is limitless, endless, and only one, it is just as easy to show up as the limited, temporary, and many. All of them are inside it, but each one also holds them all because it is all of them everywhere at the same time. The secret self has always been there. It is the self of the world and the self of each of us, including you. It has never been born and will never die. It goes into everything it makes and becomes that thing. Everything that is happening in life, the world and the universe is working toward a secret goal that hasn't been fully realized yet. The way it is, is mental and at its core, it is artistic and active. It's the timeless stuff that takes up all time and space and has no dimensions. It has no beginning or end, only differences and extremes and it is endlessly creative. The many kinds of life on Earth are just a small sample of how much plastic diversity there is, because it is basically one mental triumph. You have your secret self inside you. Many people are lucky enough to experience it, but others are not. It exists in all of us, completely. As we learn to separate ourselves from the world and the ego in physical stimuli, we will become more aware of its presence inside us and consciously try to connect with it. The seeds of power are planted when people are identified. If a person can get rid of the limits of their ego and raise the quality of their awareness by exercising their imagination, they can directly identify with their secret self and reach a certain level of its perfection power. Every single one of us has the power to reach this amazing goal. Men can become one with the purposes of their secret selves through mental elevation and picture clarity. This makes them perfect at their work and their goals. It's pretty hard to take this big pill. Three quarters of our minds have been cut out by our selfish culture and its love of scientific progress. We've been thinking too much about the world, what it is, what's in it, and how we can use it. As a result, we don't know much more about where life comes from or why it exists now than we did before people could read and write. We find it hard to believe that something completely different from what science says could be based on facts when we know something about how gasoline engines work, how electricity is made and sent, 
how steel is refined and tempered, and how electronics and radio waves work. Nature's rules are the most important, and people need to learn how to live with them if they want to do well. This idea is completely different. Nature is controlled by mind, but not the mind of man as we know it. Instead, it is controlled by the great mind or secret self that is behind life, and each of us has this secret self. By learning about it and putting it to use, we can break free from the constraints imposed by nature's law and become truly free. Thoughts turn into things in the real world. In life, each person is evolving to become fully one with their secret self. This is because the universal being that created everything has changed into a finite form or costume in order to work out the many parts of its endless and eternal nature. The deepest desire of a man's life is thus realized when he widens his understanding. People don't have to become saints to understand enough of their secret selves to use their skills in their daily lives. It's enough to know this law. What we accept as a constant mental image in our consciousness must show up in our world, because what we are in consciousness is what we are in life, and nothing can change that. It takes a lot of guts to tell yourself that you made yourself sick, scared, angry or beaten, and that you are the only one who can get rid of these feelings. Sometimes, someone with this illness will try to use the power of his mind to heal himself, but they will only do it for a short time. Suppose he is sick and in pain. He might say, I imagine myself healthy and happy, but I hurt just as much as ever. The most important thing he didn't do was imagine himself healthy and happy. He saw himself being sick and hurt. The moment he thought about being healthy and happy, he was healthy and happy. You can't say that this law only works sometimes, sometimes only, or on lucky days. It works every time and the same way every time. The pictures you keep in your mind are coming back to you right now in the real world. You can't get away from them. They circle you and either help you or hurt you. Depending on the vision that makes them, they are either good or bad, honorable or dishonorable, painful or pleasant. Of course, the pictures that are most important to you are always with you, day and night, as long as you are living and thinking and imagining. The amazing power of the secret self is that it always brings the image it sees into the world. These hypnosis studies are the best example of this point being made clear. If a man is in such terrible pain that not even drugs can help, he can be put into deep hypnosis and told that there is no pain at all. Suddenly, there is no pain. People may deeply and permanently fear groups, but while he is hypnotist, they can tell him that he actually likes them, and sure enough, he does. It's possible for him to get stronger, smarter, more aggressive, and endurable and unbreakable because these things are ingrained in his mind as facts and the image in his mind grows from them. Aha! Someone yells. Find me a good hypnotist. I want to be smart, strong, effective, and all those other good things. I also want to get rid of being weak, hurt, and failing. You can also do it with hypnosis if you are ready to give up control of your life, if you want someone else to run your life at all times, you can give it to a psychic who will recreate it in your image. It will make a small change for you though. While you may still be in the car, you will no longer be driving. If the struggle and hard work it takes to get past problems are what your secret self wants them to be, then you will have given up on life itself. There is no need for a Magician to use the power of your secret self for good in your life. There is no way for a psychic to stop your mind from making bad images unless he is with you all the time. You are the only one who is always talking to yourself, so you are the only one who can control the thoughts and ideas you have. If you let something outside of you make the image, then you have no power over your life. If you only accept pictures that match your wants, then life will help you reach your deepest goals. In any case, the great promise of the secret self is that you can change the pictures in your mind 
and change your life, because what you get in the end is only what you have been taking in your mind. On the other hand, many people agree with this idea, but are quick to point out that most people's images come from their subconscious and are not of their own choice. Many schools of psychotherapy seem to agree with this viewpoint as they promote a boring and time-consuming method aimed at clearing the subconscious mind of memories of unpleasant and painful events that could bring up nasty pictures. Most patients haven't noticed that painful memories have been cleared from their subconscious after seven or eight years of this process. Also, if a treatment really works, it can't take that long. The saddest thing about the modern put-the-blame-elsewhere school of psychoanalysis is that the person going through it accepts it as an explanation for why he hasn't been able to police his own mind and then thinks that the neighborhood should be free of thieves to do that for him. In the hands of the therapist, he might change his mind in some way, but he quickly returns to a world full of bad thoughts and ideas. And since he doesn't police his own mind, they easily feel welcome there. You might not be able to change where the stars are or stop the earth from turning, but you can choose what you think. Feel free to think whatever you want. You can only think when you have a secret goal and an inner vision, and you will win if you stand your ground with a strong will and a firm heart. They won't scare you either. Your clear and true image will be sent out into the world and it will come back to you. Chapter 2. Getting Sleep Every night we sleep, which is a third of our time on Earth. Sleep is the body's way of getting into the mind. That's why we're now worried about sleep. The amount of care we pay to sleep determines how much of our life we are aware of. As long as we know and enjoy what sleep can do for us, we will look forward to it every night, like it's a meeting with a lover. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumbering upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction. Verse 33. Prayer, which is a lot like sleep, and sleep are the only times that a person can get into his mind and get orders. The conscious mind and the subconscious mind are artistically joined in these states. The male and female bodies become one flesh. When you sleep, your aware mind leaves the world of senses to find its lover, who is your inner self. The subconscious doesn't want to change the conscious waking state like a woman in the world joins her husband to change him. Instead, it loves the conscious waking state just the way it is and carefully recreates its picture in the world of form. Your children are the conditions and events in your life that were shaped by the things that you thought and felt while you slept. They are made to look and feel like your deepest feelings so that they can show you to yourself. Just like in heaven, so on earth. Just like in your mind, so in the real world. Whatever you are thinking about before you go to sleep is how you will show up during the first two-thirds of your life. Everything that is stopping you from reaching your goal is your inability to believe that you are already that which you want to be or that which you seek. Your mind only makes your dreams come true when you feel like your wish has been granted. When you sleep, you're not aware of anything which is normal for the mind because everything comes from within you and depends on how you see yourself. Before you go to sleep, you should always feel like your wish has come true. You always pull from the deepest parts of yourself what you are, not what you want to be. You are what you believe about yourself and what you believe about other people. So, for the wish to come true, it needs to be turned into the feeling of being, having, or seeing the state that is wanted. To do this, you have to imagine that your wish has come true. In order to fall asleep, you should be completely focused on the feeling that comes up when you think about the question, how would I feel if my wish came true? Before you go to sleep, you need to be aware of being or having what you want to be or have. Man has no choice once he is asleep. His whole sleep is controlled by the last idea he had of himself when he was awake. Thus, 
he should always feel like he's accomplished something and is happy with his life before going to sleep. Come before me singing and giving thanks. Come through his gates in thanksgiving and praise. Your mood before bed determines your state of mind when you go to sleep and meet your eternal mate, the Psyche. She sees you just the way you think you are. If you convince yourself that you are successful as you get ready for bed by saying to yourself, I am successful, then you must be successful. Lay on your back with your head level with your body. Imagine what it would be like to have your wish come true, then slowly fall asleep. Those who watch over Israel will never sleep or rest. He still lets his beloved sleep though. There is no sleep for the mind. When you sleep, your aware mind can connect with your subconscious mind and get fresh ideas. The creative act is hidden by sleep, but the external world shows it. Man's idea of himself is imprinted on his mind while he sleeps. What better way is there to describe the love story between the conscious and subconscious than in the Song of Solomon? By night on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loved and found him whom my soul loved. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the room where she gave birth to me. As you get ready for sleep, you feel your wish come true and then fall asleep. Your fulfilled dream is the person you're looking for. At night, when you're lying in bed, you try to remember the feeling of having your wish come true so that you can take it with you to the room where she gave birth to you, to sleep or to your subconscious where you got your shape so that this wish can come true too. This is how you can find your dreams and guide them into your mind. Feel what it would be like if your wish came true and then quietly go to sleep. It is recommended that you feel like you are, have and see that which you want to hold and see come true every night. Don't go to sleep unhappy or down on your luck. Never fall asleep thinking about how badly you failed. Your inner mind, which is normally in a state of sleep, sees you as you think you are and it won't care if that way of seeing you is good, bad, or neutral. You make her feel the same way. And because she is the perfect lover, she gives these feelings shape and sees them as her beloved's children. You are perfect, my love. You have no flaws. Is the state of mind you should be in before going to sleep. Don't worry about how things look. Believe that they are the way you want them to be. For he calls things that can't be seen as if they were, and what can't be seen becomes visible. Thinking about being satisfied is the same thing as making conditions that will make you feel satisfied. Signs come after, not before. There won't be any proof that you are before you become aware that you are. You will always be having dreams that aren't about you. As you imagine that your dreams are real, they start to come true. Don't just think about the past. Now that you know consciousness can do anything, start to picture states beyond what you have experienced in the past. Man can make real anything his mind can think of. Before they were objectively visible, all states were subjectively unseen. You made them visible by believing they were real. First you have to picture a place, and then you have to believe it exists. Always think the best will happen. You can't change the world until you change how you see it. As inside, so outside. People and nations are only what you think they are. The only person you can change is yourself. There is no one to fight or help you make the change within yourself, no matter what the problem is, or where it is, or who it affects. Anything you want to happen will happen automatically, as long as you believe it is true. As soon as you are able to convince yourself that the state you want is real, things happen that back up your view. No matter what, you never tell someone how you want them to feel. Instead, you tell yourself that he is already the person you want him to be. Having the feeling of having your wish come true helps you make it come true. If you can't convince yourself that your wish is real, then you have failed. A change in how you say something confirms that you have changed your mind. As you drift off to sleep every night, 
you should feel complete and clean because your subjective lover creates the objective world and the picture and likeness of how you see it, which is based on how you feel. The two-thirds of your life that you are awake always backs up or confirms what you think in your mind. Things that happen and things that people do are results, not reasons. There is only choice when you have free will. Choose today whom you will serve means that you can choose the mood you're in, but the way that mood shows up is the subconscious's secret. This is the only way for the mind to get impressions, and it gives these impressions shape and expression in a way that only it knows. Man's deeds are defined by what he feels in his mind. He thinks he has free will and can do whatever he wants, but he doesn't know what makes him do what he does. He feels free because he has forgotten how he is connected to the event. Man awake feels compelled to talk about what's going on in his mind. He should start to change the way he thinks and feels right away if he foolishly praised himself in the past. Only then will he be able to change his world. Do not waste a single moment feeling sorry for the things you did wrong in the past. Thinking about them makes you sick again. The dead should be buried. Instead of focusing on how you look, think about how you would feel if you were already the person you want to be. When you feel a state, you get that state. What kind of party you throw on the world stage depends on how you see yourself. When you feel your wish come true and fall asleep peacefully, you play a star part that will be played on Earth tomorrow. You are also practiced and taught your part while you are asleep. When you accept the end, you automatically will the way to get there. Don't get this wrong. If, as you get ready for sleep, you don't consciously feel yourself into the state of the answered wish, then you will bring all of your thoughts and feelings from the day into the chamber of the woman who gave birth to you, and while you sleep, you will be taught how to express them the next day. When you wake up, you'll think you have free will, but everything that happens that day was planned by how you thought about yourself before you went to sleep. Your only choice now is to decide what to do. But the drama, actions, events, and circumstances of the day have already been planned. You can choose how you feel and respond to the day's drama. Unless you choose to be aware of the state of mind you are in before bed, you will unknowingly be in the state of mind that is made up of all your thoughts and responses from the day. Every action has an effect on the inner mind, and unless it is counteracted by a stronger and opposite feeling, that effect determines what will happen next. Putting feelings around ideas is what makes them artistic. Be smart with your natural right. All of creation is under your control because you can think and feel. You choose seeds for your garden while you're awake, but unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it stays alone. But if it dies, it gives birth to many fruits. Before you go to sleep, you plant a seed in your subconscious mind. That seed is how you see yourself. When you go to sleep feeling satisfied and happy, things and people in your life will happen that support these feelings. Going to sleep is like going to heaven. The things you take in as feelings are the things you bring out as conditions, actions, or things in space. So go to sleep with the feeling that your wish has come true. Like in awareness, so it is on earth. Third chapter. The prayer. The mind can be accessed through prayer, just like sleep. Prayer. Go into your room and close the door. Then speak to your father who is in secret, and your father who is in secret will repay you in public. Prayer is like a mirage of sleep. It dulls the senses of the outside world and opens the mind to suggestions from within. When you pray, your mind is in a state of relaxation and openness that is similar to right before you fall asleep. Prayer is more about preparing for its acceptance than it is about what you ask for. Whenever you ask for something, believe that you have gotten it and you will have it. The only thing you need to do is believe that your prayers have already come true. 
It means that your prayer has been heard if you imagine how you would feel if you already had your goal. As soon as you accept the wish as real, your mind starts working on ways to make it come true. If you want to pray well, you have to give in to your wish, which means you have to feel the dream come true. For a man with perfect discipline, the dream is always in tune with the present moment. It is clear to him that consciousness is the only real thing and that thoughts and feelings are facts of consciousness, just like things in space. Because of this, he never has a feeling that doesn't make him happy, because his feelings are what drive his actions and the events in his life. Man who isn't controlled, on the other hand, finds it hard to believe things that his senses tell him aren't true. He usually decides what to believe or not believe based only on what his senses tell him. Due to this inclination to trust the proof of the senses, they need to be blocked before one can begin to pray or try to feel what they suppress. Whenever you think, I'd like to, but I can't, you find that no matter how hard you try, you can't give in to your dream. Things you are aware of drawing to you are always what you are drawing to you. The art of prayer is to imagine yourself having what you want and feeling like you already do. When your feelings tell you that you don't have a wish, any conscious effort to fight this idea will only make it stronger. The art of prayer is to allow the wish to come true rather than to force it. When your feeling and your wish are at odds with each other, your feeling will win. The most important emotion always comes out. Prayer shouldn't take any work. When you try to fix a mental state that your feelings don't agree with, your efforts will fail. For you to successfully give in to the wish as if it were already true, you need to get into a relaxed state, like the feeling you get before you go to sleep. When the mind is this calm, it is turned away from the objective world and can easily pick up on the truth of a mental state. As long as you are aware and have the power to move or open your eyes, you are not under this state. Sitting back in a comfy chair or on a bed is a simple way to get into this quiet state. Lay on your back on a bed with your head level with your body. Close your eyes and picture yourself as tired. Imagine saying to yourself, I am so sleepy, so very sleepy. Soon, you'll feel like you're in a faraway place and you won't want to move. You're having a nice relaxing rest and don't want to change positions, even though you wouldn't be at all comfortable in other situations. When you reach this inactive state, picture that your wish has come true. Don't think about how it came true, just picture that your wish has been granted. Picture what you want to accomplish in life and then imagine that you have already done it. Thoughts make tiny speech moves that can be heard as words coming from outside when you are in a silent state of prayer. But this level of inaction isn't necessary for your dreams to come true. To feel the wish come true, all that is needed is to become silent. You already have everything you could want or need. It's already yours, so you don't need anyone to hand it to you. Imagine and feel your dream coming true to bring it into reality. Once you accept the end, you don't care at all about what might go wrong because accepting the end wills the means to that end. When you come out of the prayer moment, it's like seeing the happy, successful ending of a play without seeing how it happened. In spite of any disappointing scenes that may follow, you stay cool and confident because you know the end was perfectly explained. Fourth Chapter – Sense of Spirit Not by strength or might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of Hosts. Get into the mood of the state you want to be in by imagining how you would feel if you were already there. As soon as you feel the state you want to reach, you don't have to work to make it happen. It's already there. Every thought that came into man's mind was linked to a clear feeling. If you imagine how you would feel if you already had the thing you want, your wish will become real. Faith is how you feel. Based on your faith and how you feel, may it be. You never attract what you want, you always attract what you are. 
a man sees what he is, it will be given to those who have it, and taken away from those who don't. What you think you are, you are, and what you are, is given to you. Therefore, imagine how you would feel, if you already had your wish, and your wish must come true. So God made man in his own image, in the image of God he made him. Have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who, even though he was God, didn't think it was unfair to be on the same level as God. You are what you think you are. Do not believe in God or Jesus. Instead, think that you are God or Jesus. Those who believe in me will also do the works I do. It should read, those who believe as I believe will also do the works I do. Jesus did the works of God because he thought he was God. He said, I and my Father are one. It makes sense to do the things of the person you think you are, feel like the person you want to be, and you will become that person. Men create the truth of success in their own minds when they accept the advice they are given and follow it. A man who had lived his whole life in one shameful way lived in a small town on the western slopes of the Great Divide. He had been drilling oil wells for 35 years and had been on the cutting edge of oil research all over the United States. He had drilled 44 private wells during that time, but none of them had found oil. He had drilled in California, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, but he had not yet found oil. His name became known as Dry Hole Casey, and operators would no longer hire him. He was a nice guy, but he was just out of luck. He finally got a job in a mine in Colorado and spent his days without any hope. But he kept his digging tools. They were his first love. On the weekends, he would work on it in the garden, lubricating and cleaning its parts and treating them with routine care. In late spring, when the snow covered the mountainsides in wide, sparkling fields and the rivers and streams were high and royal, he went into the woods and sat down to look out over the valley. The valley was a hollow surrounded on three sides by steep granite outcroppings. These mountains had been a source of many minerals, including manganese, lead, zinc and silver. Our friend looked west, where the valley went down to a hill, his mind instantly made a clear picture of a faulty anticline, which is a common type of oil trap below the ground. The image looked like it was on top of what he saw, and he could almost make out the oil below the ground. He couldn't stop shaking when he saw what he saw. It seemed like a surprise visit from God, and when he left the hillside, he was sure that the small valley below held a huge oil field. The next morning, he quit his job in the mine and used his savings to buy oil lease options on the land he thought was the best. Now he had to get money to finish his lease agreements and drill the first well. This was a huge job because everyone who knew him knew he had a history of failing. What he saw in his mind wouldn't go away, so he took a bus to an eastern city to find money. After a week of feeling down, it led him to a park bench where he sat next to an old man who fed squirrels quietly and calmly. It was a sunny, warm day, and the squirrels were busy playing and acting silly over the food that was being offered. The two men laughed at their antics and told stories about other squirrels and other times. They both agreed that animals did not have the same flaws as people. They agreed to meet for lunch at a nearby restaurant because they liked being with each other. During the lunch, the oil driller told his new friend about his problem and his goal. His friend was interested and asked him a lot of questions about the vision he had on the hillside. He was pleased that it kept happening. He asked, how much money do you need? Fifty thousand dollars, the oil well driller said. The man said, I will provide it. All of a sudden, we will be equal partners. It seemed impossible, but there it was a chance meeting on a park bench, and the money was already there. It's almost a letdown to say that the next well found a rich oil field, but there was no other option, and the man who put up the money knew it would happen. 
He was sure of his position because he had enough experience with the power of inner vision to show up in the real world. He didn't think about his partner's past mistakes for a moment. Instead, he focused on the picture that was in his mind at the time. Taking off the mask of ego, what strange magic made our oil driller see this clearly in his mind? One idea changed his life and made him rich, while his whole life before had been full of failures. It seemed like the wells he had drilled before were done because of a vision. That's why they should have worked. They didn't work because his view at the time was one of failure. He could have said it wasn't true, but it was. The core of his subconscious may have been a realization of the enormous risk involved in looking for oil. He might have thought that the odds were against him, and his subconscious mind took this as the most important image. He may have known that there are millions of acres of land that don't have oil under them. Regardless, his view was one of failure, and he was led to make plans that would eventually lead him to put his drill bit down in empty ground. He drilled on fertile land twice, but once he stopped making holes only 27 feet above the profitable formation, and the other time, he forgot to test a sand that later produced several million barrels. He tried to stop himself, but he couldn't. He was just doing what the vision in his mind told him to do. What a difference it makes that he saw the oil when he found the basin field. He knew it was there. There was no question in his mind at all, and that's how he acting. This time, there was no way to stop him. His goal was production, and that's what happened. After having a bad eye for so long, why did he suddenly have a good one? You couldn't give a sure answer to that question without learning a lot about the man. But most likely, what made them weak and unable to move was fear. We can't see straight because of fear more than anything else. Our oil driller probably was scared of failing, and that fear skewed his inner view from victory to loss. He couldn't win as long as he was scared. Finally, when things were at their worst, when the men in the business he loved turned him down and wouldn't hire him, fear just left him. Things were already going badly, so what was left to be afraid of? And because of this feeling of mental ease, the secret self was able to see through the pride mask, and the vision that followed always led to success. Mind is stronger than matter. It is calculated, wrote Jonathan Swift, that 11,000 people have died more than once rather than submit to breaking their eggs at the smaller end. A lot of people, including some very smart ones, say that all calls happen in the real world and that the mind only watches. They seem determined to die with this horribly wrong view, even though their own attitudes show that they don't believe it, and even though their slogans praise the power of the mind over matter. The following slogans were posted on locker room doors and conference room walls. A quitter never wins, a winner never quits. A team that won't be beat can't be beat. Put your heart into it, all else will follow, and make up your mind, and you make up the future. However, these spoken explanations of deep vision are seen as having only been used before in teamwork to bring people together for a purpose, and their huge impact is seen as unique. Everything is done from the inside out. The oil well was dug, the movie was made, the book was written, the painting was done, the music was created, space was explored, and the secrets of the atom were revealed. Without a clear picture of what you want to achieve, there is no such thing as success. Unless you first have the mental image, you cannot physically reach across the table and pick up a dish. Everything that happens to everyone is based on the picture is, they make in their thoughts and the work they put in. In this world, building a tower to the sun is enough to avoid fates that are unavoidable. A wrong mental image can't be changed no matter how much you move or work out. For the same reason, someone with the right mental image is led to do the work easily and without much thought. Most of the struggling and trying in the world is done by people who are stuck in situations they don't want because they are visualizing the wrong things. The fact that they are visualizing the very things they say they hate 
is what makes our psychiatrist chairs so full of contradictions. As Bernard Spinoza put it, so long as a man imagines that he cannot do this or that, so long as he is determined not to do it, and consequently, so long is it impossible to him that he should do it. This means that the thought that forms in the mind will have its inevitable result, whether it is good or bad. The issue is not with the mental or spiritual fact that mental visualization can lead to physical reality. The issue is with finding a way for each person to create mental images whenever they want, hold on to them until they come true, and not have other images come in from their stubborn subconscious, which often goes against what the conscious mind wants. In the inner parts of a person's mind, the seeds that drive their whole life are planted, and a man either rises above or takes control of these unseen guides. If he goes beyond, his life will be run by something he is not aware of. If he commands, he is in charge of his own fate. It's not as easy as it sounds to be in charge. You need to be strong and brave, which is something that not many people naturally have. Most of us are completely controlled by our subconscious, and we rarely, if ever, even consider that we might be able to control our feelings and respond in a way that is completely different from what our circumstances would have us do. For instance, if you take a test and it looks like you're going to fail, the only way to be sure is to do better. But who knows what miracles might happen if you keep your spirit living with a vision of success and refuse to give in to the voices of defeat and disaster. At some point, the mental picture that doesn't respond to any sensory inputs turns into its own thing, and its resolution as an objective fact in the real world begs to be spoken and won't be stopped. There is an infinite amount of imagination in nature that comes from the secret self. It is certain that everything that can be thought of will finally be made real for everyone to see. Although ideas can be very flexible, they always have a clear end. This is because the secret self is very flexible and shapes all of its ideas. Anyone who has a thought also has a thing. The creative part of a person is not part of their ego, aware mind, body or senses, as long as they keep their image clear. From the secret self, it rises through the levels of consciousness and takes shape through a power far beyond and infinitely more powerful than the small individual I. The most powerful part of a person is invisible, seems to be separate from him, is hidden in the deepest parts of his being, can't be called by name, can't be seen or touched, and can't be forced to do anything. It only responds naturally and completely to image. This is the creative self of the universe, the great plastic secret self from which everything is made. It stays the same in all its differences and is forever one in the middle of all its differences. These are the true self that lives inside you. They are the same as you and are ultimately all you. You are not your conscious mind, your ego, your memories or your emotional being. You were born straight from the mind that created and planned the universe. You are not different from that mind. You are connected to it in a way that makes you and it the same. Giving up the outer self and looking for balance in inner parts of awareness is the way to power and perfection in works. This is because when a person connects to the mental and life force that gives him awareness and lives inside him, he takes on the power and usefulness of the infinite and eternal being from which his own life came. As his views and awareness grow, a hidden and underground source of power for perfection and perfect understanding comes to the surface and never goes away. He has a simple and unwavering faith in the magic power of his secret self to bring the mental pictures that live inside him back to real life. He doesn't even need the key that opens all the doors in the universe to use this simple law well. He doesn't mind that there are doors in the mental and spiritual worlds that haven't opened yet. The facts he has found so far are enough for him to use. He doesn't need to know and understand everything. 
His way of thinking is that life is an adventure in the mind, not a trip through the body.